This morning we have a lecture on hierarchical reinforcement learning. I'm very happy to introduce Professor Anders Johnson. He's a full professor in this uh, university, Universidad Pompeu Fabra, at the ICT department. He's also leading the research group in AI and machine learning, which is the group behind uh, this event, this year's edition of the Reinforcement Learning Summer School. He has, uh, in his research work, he combined um, reinforcement learning and planning ideas in many successful ways, but he also um, developed algorithms to improve the efficiency of learning, especially uh, exploiting the internal structure of decision processes, which could be of many kinds. Uh, one group of this kind of structures is, are the ones considered in hierarchical reinforcement learning, which is today's topic. Please uh, thank Anders together. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction and, and good morning, everyone. So, um, so at, at the time that I that I prepared my slides, the the program had this interesting feature, which was this uh, bright orange color encoding for for my for my lecture. <laughs> uh, so the last time I checked, this was not there anymore. But the explanation I got was that this was considered an advanced topic, and I could not be here next week, when which is when most of the advanced topics are happening. So that's why we are here today. Um, okay, right, so, so just to say before I start, right, hierarchical reinforcement learning is a very big topic to talk about in 90 minutes, so of course, necessarily I have to make choices of which, which uh, works I find the, the most interesting or the most important, but there are many, many more works in this field than the ones I will, I will mention here today. Uh, so, so this is an overview of, of, my, of my lecture. I will start by giving an introduction to the idea of, of hierarchical reinforcement learning, uh, and then talk about the existing formalisms that, that people tend to use. Uh, then I will talk about the theory, the, the most solid theory, I would say, of hierarchical reinforcement learning, which, which is the theory of, of semi-Markov decision processes. Then I will talk a bit about theoretical properties of, of hierarchical reinforcement learning, or the lack of such, of, of such properties. And, and finally, I will talk about two uh, maybe a bit more advanced topics in the sense of, right, uh, the, the first one, subtask discovery, is about uh, the case in which nobody gives you. So often, when you, when you apply hierarchical reinforcement learning, someone gives you this subtask sub -task structure that the agent can exploit. But in subtask discovery, the agent has to discover on its own what would be good subtasks to, to have. And the final one is on transfer learning. Now how, so because in hierarchical reinforcement learning, we solve so many subtasks, there's a lot of opportunity to transfer knowledge between subtasks. If I've learned one subtask and I'm faced with a similar subtask, I can take advantage of some of the knowledge I already gained. Okay, so, so to start with a, a motivation, you know, some of the, of the main challenges in reinforcement learning are the ones I've listed here. And in particular, some of these challenges are precisely those that hierarchical reinforcement learning can help address in different ways, which we'll see during the lecture today. So, so one important challenge, right, is sample efficiency. We'd like to, um, to for, for the learning agent to make the most use of the data, right? It, it, uh, it, it interacts with the environment in some way and it gains experience and we want learning to be as fast as possible based on, on this experience. Uh, a related challenge right, is, is to scale up to complex decision pro processes with high dimensional states and action spaces and so on. Uh, a third one is the idea of abstraction. Also, often the agent receives a lot of information about the environment, but much of this information might be relevant for the task that the agent has to solve. So then abstraction tries to focus on the relevant parts of the, of the state and, and potentially the actions as well. To, to simplify the problem representation, right? If we, if we make the state space smaller, naturally our learning problem becomes simpler. And generalization, all right, this is related to, to, to transfer that I talked about, Nord, but, but not necessarily only transfer between problems. Uh, also, we can have generalization between states, right? So if I've been in a state before and learned what action to take there, and then I face a similar state, maybe the same action will be will be good in that state also, or maybe not, sometimes not, you know, but trying to generalize knowledge from across situations. 
Uh, okay, so, so hierarchical reinforcement learning can really be viewed as an instance of, of divide and conquer, which, uh, as most of you uh, probably know, is one of the oldest algorithmic ideas. So I, I assume most of you or all of you know about uh, things like the merge sort algorithm. Right? We're given a collection of items that we want to sort, and the strategy for sorting these items is to divide the collection into two parts. And now we have two problems, which are also sorting problems. So the problems are of the same type as the original problem. Then we recursively sort these two, these two parts. And then we have a merge operation for merging these two sorted collection in, into a single sorted collection. Right? So divide and conquer uh, works in this way. You recursively divide your problem into two or more sm smaller subproblems of the same type. And then we solve those subproblems. And then we have some way of combining the, their solutions to, to, to give us a solution to the original problem. As, as we will see, uh, in certain situations, we can, uh, we can view hierarchical reinforcement learning as an instance of divide and conquer. OK, so, so let's look at an example sequential decision process, a simple one. So it's this grid world where an agent has to navigate from an initial location in the top left room to this goal location marked G. And uh, right, so it has to learn a policy from moving to, from, from the initial location to the goal location. Possibly the actions could be uh, deterministic or they, the action might fail with some small probability. It doesn't matter for, for this example. Uh, right, and, and typically the agent here will select between these primitive actions, no go north, west, south, or, or east, or if you want to call them up, down, left, right. Uh, right, and, and some of the challenges here is that when people model this problem, typically you only assign reward when you reach the, the goal state, right? And, well, in this case, the goal state is not that far from the initial state, but I, I could make this problem much bigger and make the goal state be much further away, right? So then the challenge here is the long horizon of the problem that I have to take many, many of these primitive actions in order to reach the, the goal for the first time. So it becomes a hard exploration problem. Uh, there are exploration techniques now for, for helping in such situations. I think there's a lecture on exploration on, on Friday. Uh, OK, but uh, so how, how can we, uh, so, so what would be the approach of hierarchical reinforcement learning to this problem? Well, the approach would be to, to decompose this, this problem into, into a set of subtasks. Okay, so, so in this case, we can define the subtasks as going to the doorways between the rooms, right? So, so from the top left room, I go to the bottom doorway. From there, I go to the doorway, the next doorway to my left, etc. cetera. OK. Uh, of course, each of these individual smaller problems are also sequential decision processes. OK, so I have to model those in, in some appropriate way. But if I look at the problem now, you see that there are several benefits of, of doing this decomposition because before I had a long sequence of actions for getting to the goal. And now instead I only have to chain together four, four subtasks to reach the goal. So I've effectively shortened the, the horizon of, of the problem. Uh, right? And in each subtask can be thought of as kind of a partial progress towards the goal, even though probably we could have subtasks that take me away further away from the goal as well. Right? So at the top level, I still have to, the policy at the top level still has to select correctly among which subtask, which sequence of subtasks to, to, to execute in order to achieve the goal. So then right, solving the overall tasks can be thought of as solving this sequence of, of subtasks. Uh, Right. OK, so how do we represent these subtasks? Well, a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of what I will talk about in the next two parts is about how to represent such subtasks and how to combine the solutions of these subtasks to obtain a solution to the overall task. Okay. Uh, but briefly, right, each subtask is also a sequential decision process. So for example, when I start in the top left room and I want to, to reach the, the bottom doorway, I can think of that as a smaller decision process, the one on the right, where I'm only now acting in this smaller space, this one room. And my goal now is not to reach this far away goal, but my goal is rather to reach the, the bottom doorway. Okay. 
Okay, so so I just want to, I mean, as another motivation, I want to to um, to talk about how humans solve decision processes, right? So imagine that we have to travel to to, to the airport, right? How how do humans plan such a trip? Well, I mean, many of you might have read the reinforcement learning book, and you know, I think they talk about similar examples. Now, I, as a human, right, my my basic actions, you know, is move my arm or move my leg and so on, right? So I could I could model this problem of going to the airport as this problem of taking these back basic act moving actions that I have as a human. Uh, but of course, that would give me an, an extremely long horizon you know, for, for reaching the, the airport. Right? So that's not how we think about solving this problem. Rather, we, 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 we naturally divide this problem into subtasks. Right? If I have to go to the airport, I think about, well, if I'll take the train to the airport, well, first I have to to go to the train station, then I have to get on by a train ticket, I have to get on the correct train. So I plan at this high level of abstraction, and then right, each of these high level ta tasks become subtasks that I then have to solve. Right now I decide to go to the train station, now my problem is, well, how do I get to the train station? Right? So, of course, I'm not a neuroscientist, and it's very difficult to reason about exactly how humans make decisions, but I feel fairly certain, right, that humans uh, tend to, to apply this, this form of reasoning, right? We break tasks into smaller pieces that are easier to solve, and then we chain together such subtasks to, to solve a, a given problem. Okay, so, so before I finish the introduction, I will just mention some of the, some of the benefits you know, that people have identified for hierarchical uh, reinforcement learning. So, so one I talked about, right, is to, to reduce the effective horizon of the problem because even though I might need many primitive actions to reach my, my goal or the region with, with high reward, uh, by chaining together subtasks, I might need much fewer subtasks uh, to, to reach the same goal. Uh, I might also explore more efficiently, right, if I have these subtasks that lead me to doorways, uh, then uh, right, then uh, imagine that I start in the top left room and I only take primitive actions and I just don't know what to do, right? I'm, I'm not getting any reward for any of my actions in that, in that place. So I, I just do a random walk, right? So random walk will tend to stay in the same top left corner with high probability. But if instead I randomly choose between options of going to, to, uh, to doorways, I will much quicker end up much further away from my original state than what I do if I use primitive actions, right? So subtasks also help me kind of move away much quicker in, in some particular direction, which is, of course, defined on how I've defined these, these, these subtasks to begin with. Uh, right, another uh, benefit that I'll talk about later, right, is this idea of transferring learning between subtasks. If I have two subtasks that are very similar, I could reuse knowledge about one to, to solve the other. And another idea, right, is that, uh, so what the last point says, improve sample efficiency through structured credit assignment. So what I mean by this is that, right, in the original task, the agent only got reward when it reaches the, the, the goal. But when I do subtasks, right, the subtasks get rewarded for reaching these intermediate points, right? So the agent actually kind of internally get rewarded for going to doorways on the way to reaching the goal. Right, which, which helps uh, direct the agent, even though right, in the end it doesn't know yet which direction it has to go. Uh, it still provides some intermediate points where, uh, where, where, where you get uh, credit for what you're doing. Okay, and another po possible benefit here is that if, if I know, well, if I'm given the information beforehand that the goal state is in, an, in one of these uh, doorways or hallways between the rooms, then exploring only by going to doorways, of course, re also reduces the effective exploration space for where I have to look for, for the goal. Right? So that will also make exploration much, much more efficient in this case. OK. OK, so, so then I will go into the, the, the part about existing formalisms. So the, Hierarchical reinforcement learning is almost as old as reinforcement learning itself, I would say. So most of the theory of hierarchical reinforcement learning was developed in, in the 90s. 
and by these people that I will uh, mention now. So, so the first, well, and actually, just again to say that many, many other researchers have proposed different forms of hierarchical reinforcement learning. And I'm only going to mention here the, the four most, uh, in what I consider to be the four most important ones that have been reused the most after this, after this development. Okay, so the, the first one was called the feudal reinforcement learning. And uh, in this, in this uh, framework, the consists of having, well, in this case, we don't think of one agent that solves many subtasks. Rather, the, the idea is that we have many agents that each solve some subproblem and interact with other agents in some way. In particular, uh, this is a navigation task, which this obstacle. So at the top level, you have a manager which is responsible for solving the, the whole task. At the second level, well, at the first level, actually, at level zero, we have the overall manager. At level one, that manager has four sub-managers that are each in charge of a portion of the, of the state space. And in turn, these managers on the next level each have four other sub-managers and, and so on. Like in the, at the lower level, we call these managers workers, right? Because they have nobody working below them to, 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 to give subtasks to, right? And the workers are the ones that actually execute actions in the, in the environment, uh, right? So, so how does this work? Well, managers are responsible for, this, for telling their sub-managers what the subtask should be. And then they have the power to punish and reward these, uh, these sub-managers on the next level. But of course, so this seems like they have absolute power over their sub-managers, but of course they, they, they cannot do whatever they want, but they, because they also get punished or rewarded by their, sub, by, by their super manager who has told them what to do, right? So they have to, uh, um, they have to pay attention to what the subtask they have been given, right? And, and there are two important principles that the authors uh, uh, identified. So one is called reward hiding, right? So when a sub-manager is carrying out its task successfully, it should always be rewarded for that, even if its manager was punished for doing the wrong thing, right? Because the sub-manager was doing the right thing. They, he, they, they completed the task that they were given, right? So their reward should be independent of whatever the, the manager was, uh, was told to do. Right? And the same, if he doesn't achieve the goal, it should be punished in the, in the same sense. Right? And the other one is information hiding. So this is related to this idea of abstraction. So we should only give each manager enough information to solve its task. We don't need to give it more information than, than that. Okay. Okay, so the second uh, important paper on hierarchical reinforcement learning was this a framework called Hierarchies of Abstract Machines by Ron Parr and, and Stuart Russell. Uh, so in this case, actually in, in all of the, the three frameworks I'll, that I'll talk about now, we assume that we're given an MDP, right, to start with. That, that's the MDP we want to solve. And, uh, but here the agents are in addition given these uh, finite state controllers that you have on the, on the right. So the finite state controller tells the agent what are possible uh, action sequences to, to follow or policies to follow. So each, each node in the finite state controller, well, each of the round nodes represent a behavior, right? So I have a behavior follow wall. And follow wall is also going to be another finite state controller that, that selects between other behaviors. Okay? And then we have these choose points, right? So the, the, the square node in the automaton, which is the only place where the agent has to make a choice, right? So here it has to choose whether in this state I want to follow a wall or to back off, right? So they have this environment with these obstacles, and the obstacles are intentionally made concave so that if the agent gets into an obstacle, it really has to go in the opposite direction to be able to, to get out of this obstacle. No? So that's why the, the behavior, otherwise it just could, could just follow a wall until it uh, passes the obstacle. Uh, okay, so, and so the policy of the, the only place we need to learn a policy is for these choose, uh, these choose states. 
right? Then the um, the agent has to learn what the, what to do in these two states, choice states, and the. The, the key benefit you get from these finite state controllers is that they limit the possible behaviors of the agent as at a different, at, at a particular situation, right? So it, uh, the agent does not have full, right? In this choose point, the agent cannot choose fully between going northwest, east, or south. It can just choose between those, these two high-level behaviors, right? And, and that uh, simplifies learning of, of a policy. Okay, and then uh, I've actually reversed the temporal order of the last two frameworks, just because I'm going to talk more about the, the last one. So, so this, this framework is called Max-Q decomposition. It was proposed by Tom Dietrich uh, in 2000. And, and here, again, we're given an MDP. And given this MDP, we're going to uh, specify a set of tasks. Right? And, with, and, and one of these tasks is going to act as the root at the top, M0. And uh, each task is a tuple that consists in a set of terminal states where this task terminates, a set of actions that this task can take. And these actions can either be primitive actions of the MDP or other subtasks, right? so, uh, or subset of other subtasks. So each task has a subset of actions and subtasks and that it can choose from. And which subtask they can choose from is illustrated in this graph here, right? So the root task can choose between the two tasks, get and, and put. Get can choose between the primitive action, pick up, or a navigate task. And the navigate task can choose between the primitive actions, uh, north, south, east, west. Okay. And the third component of each task is a, what's known as a pseudo reward function, right? So again, the, when you're learning to perform a task, you need to be rewarded for completing that task in, 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 in some way, even if at the high level MDP, there's no reward for, for reaching that, for, for completing that task, right? So each task has kind of its own reward function that governs what, what, what it should do or what its policy should do. Okay, and then the last framework uh, is called the options framework. And I would say it's not really even arguable that, I mean, this has become the, the most popular framework for, for hierarchical reinforcement learning in, in the literature. So it was introduced by, uh, by Rich Sutton, uh, Doina Prikap, and Satinder Singh, I believe, in 1999. Um, and uh, here, again, we start with, a, with an MDP. And an option is also a tuple that has several components. And the first component is the set of states where we can apply the option. This is called the initiation set. Right? So IO is a subset of the states where we can apply the option. Uh, pi O is the option policy. So the policy chooses uh, between actions. So, well, this policy could either be stochastic or deterministic. Actually, in here I've written this as a stochastic policy. But in fact, in, I think in most of my uh, other slides, I assume that it's deterministic. Right? So it selects one action in, in each state. Uh, and each option also has a termination function. So termination function is for each state, a mapping for, from each state to a value between 0 and 1. And this value is the probability of terminating in that state. Right? So it, the value could either be 0, I don't terminate in this state. It could be one, I always terminate in this state. Or it could be something intermediate. So say it's 0 0.5, then I have to sample a value, draw a random value uh, uniformly between 0 and 1. And if it's less than the probability, then I terminate in that state. Okay. All right, so, well, so this is what it, it says here. So the option can be chosen in any state in its initiation set. It repeatedly selects actions according to its policy. And then it terminates in a given state with probability beta O of S prime. Okay. So an option might run for multiple time steps until it comes to a state where it, where it terminates according to my, my random pool. OK, so as I said, I will talk most of the next couple of sec sections. I will talk extensively about the, the option framework. OK, so, so before I finish the, this part, I want to, as, as I mentioned, there have been many 
attempts to define the, the idea of hierarchical decomposition and, and reinforcement learning. And I would say one problem is that there's been no strong common terminology even among, among researchers, right? So as an example here, there's a huge number of names that have been used for this idea of sub-problem. So, so we've already talked about task or subtask or, and manager and worker in feudal reinforcement learning. Sometimes I've seen the notation master and slave for, for manager and sub-manager. Option, we just saw some people call these temporally extended actions, macro action, activity, skill, behavior, mode. Okay, so, so all of these essentially mean the same thing. They are not exactly defined always in exactly the same way, but the idea is that all of these represent subtasks that the agent can, can perform uh, as part of achieving its overall task. Okay, so, so as I said, the, the most solid theory in, in hierarchical reinforcement learning, I would, I would say, is the one on, on semi-Markov decision processes. So I'm gonna, in this part, I'm going to explain this theory and how it relates in particular to the options framework. So actually, semi-Markov decision processes is, is older than hierarchical reinforcement learning itself. So semi-Markov decision process was already proposed in, in the 60s, not, not long after uh, Markov decision processes, uh, and the idea here, so the, the only difference with respect to an MDP is that we assume that the actions have variable duration, right? And, and this, this variable duration might be, is a random variable that, uh, that uh, is drawn every time you apply an action. Uh, right, so formally, so I'm going to use the notation I'm going to use in the rest of the slides, hopefully consistently is that an SMDP, I'm going to use this hat notation for an SMDP. So SMDP will also be labeled M, right, because it's really very similar to an MDP. And uh, right, this, the state action and reward function and transition function are going to be S, A, R, and P with this hat on it. Okay? So the definition is exactly the same as that for MDPs, set of states, set of actions, reward function. The only difference is the transition function, right? So the transition function now is, right, for each state action pair, we have a probability distribution not only over the possible next states, but also over the possible duration of action A, of an action when applied in a, in a, in a given state, right? So, so this notation here, the probability of reaching state S prime in N time steps, when applying action A in state S, it's the probability of transitioning to S prime uh, in this many time step. Okay. Okay. And uh, once we have this notation, we can set up a Bellman optimality equation, which I assume you've seen plenty of this, this week already. Uh, so, the, so, so to set up the Bellman optimality equation, we can define a state value in the same way as for an MDP. So I have the, the optimal value function uh, in a state S can be written as the maximum over the actions I can take in that state, the reward I obtain for that action in that state, or the expected reward, and then a summation over ne possible next states S prime. And now I also have to sum over the possible durations of, of the action. So I have to sum over N and then put in this uh, transition probability, you know, probability of transitioning to S prime in N time steps, given S and A. And I have to, if I'm discounting, I have to properly discount the, the value of the next state S prime. Right? So I have to discount N times uh, the, the optimal value of S prime if the action lasts for N time steps. Okay? And uh, and I can make this look even more like an optimal Bellman equation for an MDP by introducing this kind of pseudo transition function P tilde, okay, which, which looks very much like the transition function of an MDP. It's just the probability of, well, it's, it's not an actual probability, as I'll tell you in a second, but it well, can be thought of as the probability of reaching a state S prime given SA. And it just corresponds to this part in red from, from above. Right, it's the summation over n, the probability of reaching S prime in n time steps, and then times this uh, uh, discount factor 
uh, exponentiated to n, right? So, so actually, this pseudo transition function is not an actual probability distribution because of this discounting we have here. But you can still define things this way, and you obtain something that looks very, very much like the Bellman optimality equation for an MDP. Okay, and as you might imagine, if we have something that looks very much like a Bellman equation for an MDP, it's not difficult to adapt all the standard reinforcement learning algorithms to SMDPs. We can do value iteration, policy iteration, Q-learning, et cetera. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show an example of Q-learning uh, in a bit. Uh, so, so really, I mean, you can, you almost can think of having this extension to, uh, to variable duration for free, in a sense. You know? So probably you have to pay a little bit of price of, of having to consider uh, very long possible durations of actions. You know? But, but the, the, the reinforcement learning algorithms do not become much more complicated when you, when you work with SMDPs. Okay, so the, the key idea here is that if I have an MDP and I give you a set of, uh, of options, as defined before, this defines a semi-Markov decision process, okay? Uh, and in particular, I'll try to use this, right? So in particular, the SMDP that we get, so, so I have an MDP and a set of options O, and the SMDP I obtain has some state space the, the action set is, in fact, the set of options. Okay, so this, the action space here is O. And then R and P, the, the SMDP, reward function and transition function, are going to be defined as below. Okay, so S, or this S hat, is a set of states where the options are applicable, which might, of course, be the same as the overall state space S, but it could also be smaller. Right, so you could do things like, I could define a set of options that only terminate in certain regions of the state space. So I, I will never consider action choices in some other states where options never terminate. Right, so I could make the, the, the state space effectively smaller. Uh, and we're going to look at some ways of, do, of doing that later. The, the reward associated with applying an option O in some state S0, it's just going to be the sum of discounted rewards. Well, it's the, expecta it's, it's the expected sum of discounted rewards when following the policy of the option, right? This pi O is the policy of the option, right? So when I'm in some state SI, I take the action prescribed by the, by the option policy. Well, this is conditional right on starting in state uh, S0. And uh, these SIs are random variables denoting the, the state at time i. So the expectation is over these states. And the t is also random variable denoting the duration, the expected duration of the, of the option, right? which might vary from execution to execution. OK, and the probability of transitioning to a state S prime in n time steps starting from S0 and applying option O, is just going to be the sum over all possible sequences of intermediate states, you know, S1 to Sn minus 1, and then the probability of following exactly this sequence of states. Right? So the probability for, for, for each i from 1 to n minus 1, it's the probability of transitioning to, uh, the probability according to the MDP of transitioning to Si from Si minus 1, when following the option policy, times the probability of not terminating in that state, okay, because we want the option to terminate after exactly n states, and then all of these times the probability of finally transitioning to S prime from S n minus one, again following the option policy, and actually terminating in S prime, because that's, that's how long, that's what we need to do in order to have exactly duration n. So, right, so the, the, yes, question. The set S hat, is that the union of I sub O for each little O? Okay, good question. So I, I actually had it written like that first, but so, right, you could define S hat as the union of the initiation sets of all the options. 
But you could also do, so as I said, you could also restrict the termination conditions of the options to only terminate in some subsets of states. So even if the options are applicable in other states, they will never actually, you will never actually be in that state to, exit, to apply the option. Well, you could adjust the initiation sets to account for that. So, so yeah, I think it would be fine to, to define it in the way that you suggest. Okay. Okay. MDP is given or we construct it? Okay, uh, so good question, right? So, so do we assume that the SMDP is given or the set of options is given? So actually, I'm going to come to this in, okay. in, uh, in just a couple of slides. Okay, right? So, so the point, I think the, the origin of this question is right here. We assume that the option set is given. Right? That includes the option policy, so someone has to tell us exactly what policy each option is following. Right? We, yes? And is there a quantitative measure to say how good the SMDP is with respect to the original MDP? Like okay, I'm, I'm going to partially address this as well in, in, in later slides. Okay. Um, okay. But, right, so, so this is the important, I mean, this is the important property that the original authors of options notice, you know, that I can, I can enhance an MDP with a set of options, and that induces an, an SMDP. Right, so, okay, so, well, I'm going to illustrate this on the next slide, but just to say also that the primitive, each primitive action can actually be thought of as a special case of an option. So you can include primitive actions in your action set as well. Right, so the, a, a primitive action can be thought of as an option which is applicable everywhere, or, I mean, some actions might not be applicable in all states. Right? So initiation set will be all the states in which this action is applicable. The policy always selects that action with probability one, and the action always terminates after one st time step, so beta, the beta function is always equal to one for each state. Right? I take the action, once, and then in the next state, I always terminate. Okay. So, so this means I can include primitive actions in an option set as a special case of an option. Okay, so, <clears throat> sorry. Right, so, so here, what's shown here, right, if, you, if, if, uh, if we're in an MDP, then the agent will take a decision at each time step. Right, so the, the, the decisions are regular in the sense they all happen with the same kind of time interval. In an SMDP, because each action might take a variable amount of time, then after I take my first action choice, I might have to wait for some time, then I take an action, make an action choice again, then I wait for a different amount of time, etc. So I don't necessarily make, make decisions at each individual time step. And in the case of options over MDPs, I have a, a decision process on two levels. Right? At the top level, I have the induced SMDP. So the induced SMDP chooses among which options to, to, to apply. Right? And each time I, so the SMDP policy will be the, the big circles. Right? It chooses an option, then it has to wait for that option to terminate, which type might take a variable amount of time, and then the SMDP policy makes the next choice. But inside of each option, we, take, we still take, make uh, an action choice at each time step using the option policy. Right? So you have a high level, you have uh, act, you, the agent acts at two time scales, right? at the high level, at the SMDP level, and at the low, op low level option level. Okay, okay. so so this relates to, to the earlier question, right? So, okay, sorry, this is an example first. So, so I just wanted to put in something that you've seen before this week, which is Q-learning. So, so this, this slide shows how to apply Q-learning when I'm working with uh, options, right? So assume that we apply an option O in a state ST, uh, then we keep selecting repeatedly actions using the option policy pi O, and we check termination using this termination function beta O. And then we assume now that the option terminates in state ST plus N after N time steps. Okay. So how do we apply Q learning in this case? Well, the first thing we have to do is to maintain a sum of discounted rewards. 
Right? So while the option is executing at the low level, we register how much reward we receive at each of those time steps, and then we sum up the rewards that we got while executing the option. So this uh, uppercase RT will be the sum right from k equal to 0 to n minus 1 of the reward at time t plus k, and each of them discounted by k. And now I can just state the update rule of Q-learning with options as follows, right? It's, it's uh, the, the new value of the state option pair S, T, and O is going to be 1 minus alpha T times the old value plus alpha T, the target, where the target now is this sum of discounted rewards I got during the option execution. And then the, the maximum Q value in state S, T plus N over all the possible options I can select there, and discounted by n, right? Because I, the option lasted for, for n time steps. So I have to discount appropriately by n times. OK. Right, so, so all the theory, so, so this was, the, the, I think, the, the question that was asked before. No, all the theory so far assumes that the options are given. And the options are given, that includes the, the option policies, right? So someone tells us, for all of these subtasks that are presented by the options, someone has, has to tell us what the option policies should be. But of course, more often than not, the agent doesn't know what, when, we, when you apply reinforcement learning the first time, we don't, the agent doesn't know what, what actions to select, right? So, so what if option policies are not provided as, as prior information? Well. Uh, as I said before, uh, uh, a subtask is also a sequential decision process, right? So what we can simply do is define a local MDP for that option, and uh, the option policy will be implicitly defined as the solution to this option MDP, right? So, so I learn an option uh, policy from experience by solving this, this option MDP. Right, so the option MDP, I'm just going to use this notation again, like the ordinary MDP, but now with subscript O to indicate that this is the local MDP for an option. Uh, right, and again, the, 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 states, the state space of the option might be smaller than the, the, the full state space, as we will see. The action space might also be smaller than the, the overall action space. I might only allow the, action, the option to select among uh, a subset of the actions of the original MDP. And the transition function is basically just going to be the, the projection of the MDP transition function to this potentially smaller state action space of the option. Right? So the, the option probability PO of SNA is just going to be the equal to P and S, uh, uh, of SNA for the MDP. Uh, but then a question is, how do we define this, this, uh, the option reward function? Right, so as we talked about, we should define a reward function that makes the agent or this option solve its, its associated subtask. Okay, so I'm going to talk, I'm not going to tell you yet, but I'm going to talk about some different choices for how to define such a reward function in the next few slides. Okay, so, right, so one idea to define an option reward function is to, uh, right, particular when we are interested in, in reaching a state or a subset of states, is just to define a reward function that assigns reward when we reach the correct termination state of the option. Right? So in, this, in, the, in the example from before, if I'm in the top left room and my subtask is to navigate to the lower doorway, I, I put a, a, a goal state there, and I give the agent a reward when it reaches this goal state, even though in the original MDP there's no reward associated for, for reaching that goal state. Okay? So in this sense, the option reward can be the independent of the overall task. Okay? So this is related to this principle of reward hiding that I talked about for, for feudal reinforcement learning, that the option should be rewarded for, for solving its subtask uh, uh, rather than just having the same reward as the, as the overall MDP. Okay. But this, has, this introduces some problems of its own, which I'll talk about next. Okay, well, first, just to say that, uh, right, with, with the theory that I've now introduced, 
we really achieved something that, uh, that resembles or achieves uh, uh, divide and conquer. Right, so it's an example of divide and conquer. I take an MDP, I uh, divide it into subtasks which are in the form of these option MDPs. So each subtask is its own decision process, so it's of the same type as the overall problem. Then I solve the option MDPs, and then I combine their solutions by making an SMDP policy that chooses among the subtasks at a high level. Right? So, of course, uh, just like in merge sort, you know, the, the problem is not solved when I've solved this, the, the subtasks or the smaller problems. I still have to do, make an effort to, to solve the overall task by, by computing this SMDB policy. Okay, well, another issue is that if I do, if I do this two-level two learning at the same time, right, I have at the top level, I'm learning an SMDB policy. And at the bottom level, I'm learning option policies. Well, the, the induced SMDP I showed you before assumes that uh, the option policy is stationary, right? But if I'm now changing the option policy over time, that introduces an effect of non-stationarity the, at the SMDP level. Right? Changing, the option, changing the policy of a single option will mean that the, the SMDP reward function and transition function will change over time, right? So non-stationarity makes the learning problem harder, essentially, right? So, so in principle, learning option policies and SMDP policy at the same time is unstable or can be unstable. But many people tend to do this in practice and most, more often than not, this, this converges, right? Even though, as I will tell you later, I don't know of a single work that proves convergence when you, uh, when you act at the, when you learn policies at, at the two levels at the same time. So I think that's a very interesting open, open question. Um, okay, so another, so, so I'm gonna come back again to, to this idea of local rewards, right, or these option specific reward functions. Uh, so, the well, the idea is that the hierarchical structure might prevent you from, from, uh, uh, from finding the optimal policy for the original MDP. Uh, so here are two, so, and Dietrich, uh, in his work on Mexico de decomposition, already uh, defined two novel notions of optimality for hierarchical reinforcement learning. Okay, so I'm gonna explain these two notions using these two figures. Okay, so the first notion of optimality is called recursive optimality. Recursive optimality means that each option policy is learned uh, optimally, given the, uh, the definition of the option MDP of, of, of each option. So each option policy is locally optimal, and the SMDP policy is also optimal on top of these option policies. But, so, so the, the example on the, on the left here shows that this does not always correspond to a globally optimal policy. So here in the, in the left example, assume that there is an option in the left room for exiting the room uh, using one of the two doorways. And if we, if we reward this option equally for going through either door, then the policy we obtain is the one showed here. Right? And in particular, the black, the black arrows show states where we are taking uh, actions that are locally optimal for this policy, because the closest doorway is the one at the bottom, but it's not an optimal action with respect to the overall goal, which is to reach the, the goal in the top right corner. Okay, so recursive optimality, each option is locally optimal, but we might not have a globally optimal policy. Okay? And hierarchical optimality means that Given the hierarchical structure that we're given, the, the set of options, the policy is optimal with respect to this hierarchical structure. Okay, so what, I, what do I mean by that? Okay, so, so in the left, in the left example, hierarchical optimality would be achieved simply by changing the direction of these black arrows, right? Uh, to go up, the, the option could act this way. There's nothing that prevents the option from going up instead of down. 
right? So to obtain an, a, a hierarchical optimal policy, the option would need to go up in these, in these states. Uh, but on the right, I put another example. So let's assume the agent here is in the middle, in the middle square. And in these middle squares, the only options available to the agent is to, to go to one of the four corners. So one, two, three, or four. Uh, and let's say that from four, it could take another option that goes to the goal state. Okay, but this option is not available in, in A. Right, so the, the, hierarchical, right, the hierarchical structure I've imposed by defining these options prevents the agent from going directly to the goal state. Right, so the best I can do, given the hierarchical structure, is to go to the corner four and then apply the option for going back to, to G. Right, and clearly this is not an optimal policy for, for the overall MDP. Right. Okay, so... Um, so for, for defining the option reward, what the option reward should be, there are two extremes you can consider. Okay, so one extreme is the one we've seen, where we just reward the, the option equally for reaching any terminal state. Okay, so we would uh, give the same reward to the option for reaching the upper or the lower doorway. Okay, and then we would, achieve the, we would achieve this policy that we saw on the, on the previous page. Another idea that we might consider is, uh, right, the, I call this uncoupled, right, because this reward for the, for the option, this local reward for the option, is unrelated to the high-level task we have, to sh we have to solve, which is to, to get to the, to the upper right corner. And this is the reason why the recursively optimal, so the recursively optimal policy on the last page is not globally optimal. Okay. And another idea would be that you might consider is to, to make the options fully coupled in the sense that the reward I will give to the option in the left room for reaching one of the doorways is going to be the value of the option in the right room for, for reaching the goal. Okay. So this seems great, right? Because then I will typically get a higher value at the top door uh, because I'm closer to the goal. And then likely the option in the left room will decide to go up instead of down in, this, in these problem states. Okay. What's the problem of doing this? Well, if you do this, then you're not really taking advantage of hierarchical decomposition anymore, right? Because you're learning a policy or a, a, an act, you're learning an action value function or a value function on top of all states again, right? Because the option, the, the option in the left room will be bootstrapped based on the option in the right room, right? So I'm not really, I'm, I'm not simplifying learning because I'm learning a policy or a value function over all states again, right? But a very interesting research question, I think, which nobody has fully solved, I would say, is to find some intermediate between these two, right? Because we would like, the, I mean, here, if our goal is to reach the top left, the top right corner, we would like the option in the left room to prefer the, the top doorway in some way, but without fully coupling so that we have to solve the, the full problem uh, again. Okay. So I think this is a, a, a very interesting open research question. Okay so, okay, so before finishing this part, right, I mean, now we've, we've seen that if, if, I want to, if I want to apply hierarchical reinforcement learning to my problem, the number of design choices I have to make Right, when, I, when I design the problem, I have to potentially decide which options to include, what subtasks this option should solve by defining the, the termination function appropriately. Uh, I, I need to find out whether I can achieve these option policies prior to learning, or I have, I have these option policies available as prior knowledge or not. If I do, typically I don't have them, so I have to define these option MDPs in some way so I can learn the option policies from experience. Uh, I have to decide whether I should include primitive actions in the, in the option set. I'll come back to this in, in the next part. And also, I mean, 
to simplify learning or really take advantage of hierarchical decomposition, I would like this SMDP to be simpler to solve than the, the, the original task. That's the whole goal of divide and conquer is to, to make the, the problem simpler. Right? So, so, so one thing I will talk about in the next section is, is state abstraction. How can I simplify the, the problem at the, at the high level? Hi, thanks. Um, so I'm curious. I don't see termination probabilities like the the beta O's on this slide. Is that not a design choice as well? Like something like telling me that, that it's terminated once I've hit one of the doorways in that original mm -hmm. picture. Right. I mean, I, I which subtasks should they solve? That's what I'm. Where I mean, what what subtask I should solve is determined by how I define this termination function. So that it so comes. It's implicit in that. Yes. Right. But you're right. I mean. Which subtask sh should I solve? Maybe a high-level question, but then I have to actually go in and say what what should the termination function be in each state? So you're right. I mean, it might. Um, when you said on an earlier slide, check using beta o whether the termination condition has been met. Is that usually going to be defined in terms of some external, like measurable event in the underlying MDP? Right, I mean, so I explained this before, right? So if, if, if the termination function is zero, then I never terminate. If it's one, I always terminate. But if it's intermediate, I have to roll a dice or I have to sample a random number, right? So if the probability of termination in a state is 0 0.5, I have to... I'll take the question off. Okay. Yeah. But typically, no. I mean, it's just this simple, simple uh, mechanism. Okay. Okay, so I've actually gone quite a bit over time on that part, I think. So I'll try to go faster on, on the rest. Uh, so I think someone asked this question, or how, how, how do we measure the complexity of, of learning? Well, the complexity of learning depends on, or the sample complexity of learning depends on several parameters. But I mean, first and foremost, it depends on the size of your state action space. Right? It also may depend on things like the mixing time or the diameter and so on. Which, which I'm not going to talk about, but let's focus on the size of the state action space, right? So to really simplify learning when we do hierarchical decomposition, we would like both the SMDP and each option MDP to be smaller than the original MDP. I mean, then, then we really achieve simplification, or we would then... Uh, uh, we, 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 we obtain smaller decision processes that are simpler to, to solve than in the original task. Okay? But, but these, two, these two desired properties are opposed in the following sense. Right? In, on one extreme, I could define only a single option. And in that case, if I only have a single option, that option has to do all the work. So it has to, its policy has to correctly maximize reward. Right? So, so if I have a single option, then the SMDP learning problem is trivial. Always select the, the single option. But the option MDP is going to be roughly as, as complex as the original MDP, because that option has to, do, has, has to learn about all the, the MDP dynamics. On the other extreme, I could have options that just act in a single state. Right? So each option only acts in a single state. So they are effectively like primitive actions. So then the option MDPs are trivial to solve, or, or just like uh, multi-armed bandits. Uh, but the SMDP decision process now is as hard as the original MDP, because the SMDP has to decide in each state which, which action to take, essentially, or which option. Right? So, so ideally, we would like to find a, a, a trade-off you know, that, that g gives you a reasonably sized SMDP and also reasonably sized uh, option MDPs. Okay. And as far as I know, again, nobody has ever quantified what this trade-off should be to, 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 uh, to maximize the benefits of hierarchical reinforcement learning. OK, well, what about including primitive actions? Well, the good thing about including primitive actions is that I will, I will always be able to obtain the optimal policy for the original MDP, because I, I could always select the, by, um, among the primitive actions and ignoring the options. But then, I mean, the size of the SMDP now is going to be at least the size of the MDP, so I don't gain any benefits in, in this sense. There might be some other benefits that, that I get, but not in terms of the size of the state action space. 
Uh, okay, so one topic I wanted to talk quickly about at least is, is state abstraction, right? So the idea of state abstraction is you, you take your state space and you map it onto a smaller space, uh, which I call Z here. So similar to this principle of information hiding, only give to each uh, manager or each subtask the information that you need to solve that, that subtask. And then you compute a policy for this smaller abstract space. And ideally, you should then be able to translate this policy back to the original space. Okay. Uh, and because when we're doing hierarchical reinforcement learning, because there's so many subtasks and tasks, then there are many opportunities for state abstraction. Right? So ideally, you could do state abstraction both at the high level and at, at the low level. Okay. So the aim here would be to accelerate learning both of the SMDB policy and of the option policies. Uh, so one, one setting in which you can, one uh, common setting in which you can achieve state abstraction is when you have a factor representation. I, I don't know if anyone will talk about factor representations in, in one of these lectures, but the idea is that in, in actually in most realistic reinforcement learning tasks, the state is not a black box. No, the state is, consists of a, of, a, of a set of, vari of values drawn from some set of state variables. So you have D state variables or D features if you want. Uh, right? and, and the key idea here is that some of these state variables might be conditionally independent. Right? And if you know which, so here, I, I'm not going to tell you what the example is, but if state variables are independent, that means their value at the next state is independent of some of the other state variables at the previous state. And in particular, if I choose a subset of state variables that introduces an abstract space, which is the cross product of only the chosen state variables, right? And it's extremely easy to project a state onto the smaller abstract state. I just ignore the, the state variables that I left out. Okay, so this is a... Uh, Right, so the, the limitation here is that you have to know um, what this conditional independence is, which is not an easy problem to, to learn from experience. Right, so Dietrich identified five different types of what he calls safe state abstraction. So safe state abstraction are types of abstraction you can apply, you can apply specifically in hierarchical reinforcement learning while uh, and does not affect the, the, the optimality of the policy. Okay. Um, okay, so the, the names here are not so important. So he gave these names that are, can be a bit difficult to understand. But the main idea is to, to, to use this factor representation, right? If I solve a subtask, then, and I know that the subtask only depends on the few of the state variables, I can ignore all the state variables that are irrelevant for solving this subtask, right? There's some other cases like uh, result distribution irrelevance, which, which says that if, if, if I take an option in two different states, and I have exactly the same probability of reaching a terminal state, then I don't need to keep separate value functions for these two states. I can treat them as, as if essentially as the same state with respect to, to this policy at this level. Okay. Or I might, the, the last case says that right, if, if, uh, if I know that an option will never be applied in a certain state, then I don't have to keep a val an action value for, for that state option combination, for example. Uh, okay, so I just put, so, so the remarkably, I think there's a very big opportunity to do theoretical research in our, in our reinforcement. reinforcement. There, there are remarkably few uh, theoretical results. Okay, so there are a few convergence results, right, that were proven actually by the original authors, but, but all of these convergence results assume that the option policies are given. So as I said before, I don't know of a single result that proves convergence when you're learning at both levels at the same time. And there was a recent convergence proof for the average reward setting uh, from a couple of years ago. And uh, few authors have also looked at sample complexity and regret for hierarchical reinforcement learning. Uh, so, well, I'm not going to have time to go into the details here. Uh, but the sample complexity, a particular form of sample complexity, the regret, 
So I, ju I just actually found, I did a quick literature search, so I found an, a recent uh, result on regret from, from this year, which I haven't read in detail, but uh, all the previous works, as, again, assumed that the option policies were given, which is a limitation. The paper from this year actually learns on both levels of abstraction, but it learns the option policies first completely, and only then learns the, the SMDP policy. Okay, so it does not learn both in, in parallel. Uh, okay. Okay, I think I'm doing okay on time. So, so in the next section I'm gonna talk, right, so, so far the theory assumes that at least the, the option MDPs are known. Right, I know what the subtasks are that I want to solve. Uh, but what if the agent starts out without having any knowledge of what the subtasks should be? So in this case, what we can try to do is to di discover subtasks, well, either from experience or from some pl problem structure that, that we have. So as, as we've talked about, like the subtask is encoded in the termination function of, of options and partially also right in the reward function that tells you what, which termination states are good and which are not good. Uh, right, so, so the advantage of doing subtask discovery right, is that even if you're just given an MDP and nothing else, I can still try to take advantage of hierarchical decomposition by, by finding subtasks myself. Of course, the drawback is that I'm making the learning problem a, a whole lot harder, right? because uh, finding what the good subtask should be is a, is a difficult problem on its own. So, so often I would say intuitively, I would say it's probably only worth making the effort to learn a subtask structure if I'm gonna solve multiple tasks in the same environment. Otherwise, I might be better off just solving the MDP. If I'm only asked to solve the MDP once, then probably the effort of, of discovering subtasks is gonna be equivalent or, or similar to, to, uh, to actually solving the original task. Okay, so, so there were many early approaches uh, for, for subtask discovery. So this was actually also part of my PhD thesis many years ago. Uh, so all of these have the limitation that they were for the, mainly for the tabular setting, right? But, and just quickly, some of these ideas, right? So, so, so some authors looked at what's known as bottleneck states or landmarks. No? So if, if, if the agent always has to go through a state to, to achieve high reward, then this state becomes a good, tar good candidate for, for a subtask, right? So you try to find states where the agent almost always passes through, and you introduce subtasks that take the agent to those states. Uh, so my dissertation was on analyzing factor structure, so similar to what I showed you before. If, if I know, if I have this structure of conditional independence between state variables, I can use that to identify which are useful subtasks to be able to, to apply. Uh, some authors looked at, they built a state graph, right? I mean, if, if my state space is small enough, I can build a graph and then analyze this graph in some way. Uh, so I think Menach et al, they, they tried to, to find uh, uh, a mean cut, right? So they tried to find, <laughs> to divide the graph into two parts using as few edges as possible. And then those, right, moving between the two partitions become the, the subtasks. Uh, right, this policy fragments means if I solve many tasks in an environment and it happens that many of the policies are the same in some of the states, I can make those kind of policy fragments into subtasks. And uh, detecting novel states is similar to these bottleneck states. While I explore, I revisit states a lot, but then I happen upon kind of a new region of the state space where, where, where many of the states I've never seen before, then probably these novel states represent parts that I have to go through to, to reach high reward areas. People tried clustering, which again requires representing the state space explicitly. And skill chaining means you start with some region that you know that you have to go to, and then you learn options. You kind of perform regression. So you, you learn options that reach these, these target states. Once you have such options, you try to learn other options that reach the initiation sets of these options. So you kind of ch chain skills backwards that are capable of reaching the, the target area. Okay, so, so more recent work, there's uh, this work called the Option Critic Architecture, 
which was proposed uh, six years ago. Uh, so option critic is inspired by action critic, which you haven't seen yet, which I think, which I've been told you will see later this today. But it's not important to understand the, the main idea, at least. So, so the main idea here is to, to formulate an objective function for SMDPs with a fixed number k of options. And then with the, the authors derive a gradient, not only with respect to the SMDV policy, but also with respect to the policy and termination function for the individual options. And then we can just optimize the parameters of the option policy and the termination function using gradient descent. Okay, so the, the architecture looks something like this. Um, so we have, right, so at the bottom is the environment, the, the agent sends an action, we get back a state and a reward. So very informally, a critic is basically maintaining a value function which criticizes how well the, the agent is doing, and the actor, or in this case the options, are the ones responsible for selecting actions. Right, so the reward gets passed to the critic. The critic actually maintains value functions both for the SMDP and for the individual options. And then we use gradients from those critics to update the option policies, uh, the option policies and termination functions here, and also the SMDP policy, which is the one choosing uh, among options. Okay, so the main, the main contribution here was to learn the subtask structure, right? Both the termination function and the policies of the options uh, using something like deep learning, right? Because you can do this using stochastic gradient descent. You can learn all of this simultaneously, right? So it achieves this simultaneous learning of the option policies and uh, the SMDB policy. Okay, but, but it has many, several limitations, right? So one limitation is that uh, if you leave it on its own, it tends to discover that the optimal thing to do is to apply primitive actions, which is natural because we know we're using primitive actions, we can always represent the optimal policy, right? So, so the authors have to specifically prevent <laughs> options from terminating in one step in order to get more meaningful subtasks. Uh, it also, this also tends to create options regions that are not strongly connected, right? I mean, intuitively, we would like an option to act in a region that's strongly connected where, where the subtask is to, to reach some, some certain target. And, and because the regions are not strongly connected, it's difficult for a human to interpret what the, the options actually do. And I mean, my personal reflection is probably that uh, in, in almost all cases of hierarchical reinforcement learning, it's sufficient to have a termination condition which is either zero or one, right? Either a state is a terminal state or it's not. Okay, so, so having intermediate values is precisely what allows them to do gradient descent here because it's much easier to do, to compute the gradient of a continuous variable. But it's also the reason why, you know, you, you have something so expressive that you can terminate with some probability that what you get is, is potentially not that clearly defined, what the subtask structure is. Okay, and another uh, recent work is something called Eigen Options, which was proposed by Machado and co-authors. Uh, the idea here is uh, to exploit something called successor representation. So successor representation of a policy basically measures occupancies of future states given that I start in, in some state, right? So the, the successor representation from a, starting from a state S of a given state S prime is, well, how many times, how, how, what proportion of the time will I be in state S prime when I start from state S and follow some policy? And often if I'm using discounting, I will discount these occupancies appropriately according to the time step when, I, when, I, when I'm in this state S prime. And previous work had shown that the eigenvectors of these successor representations give us something called proto-value functions. And the idea of eigen options is to define options whose reward functions are such proto-values. Okay, so I'm gonna illustrate this a bit better on the next slide, right? So here's, here's uh, a simple grid world again, this four-room environment. Uh, assume that, so I think in this case, they just take a random policy. 
Right, so I explore this environment using a random policy, and I build, I learn this successor representation, and then I compute the eigenvectors of this successor representation. So this, these images show the first three eigenvectors. Right, so you can see the first eigenvector prefers being in the top right, right room and avoids the, top, the, the bottom left room. And the second eigenvector likes the top left room and avoids the, 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 the bottom right room, and so on. And the idea of eigenoptions is to, to use, for each of these, well, each of these eigenvectors have a well-defined maximum and minimum. So for each eigenvector, we can in introduce two options. One that tries to go to the maximum value of the eigenvector. Right? The eigenvector has one value per state. Right? So it, there's some state which has maximum value. So the option will try to go to that, uh, the state with maximum value, and we will define that state as a termination state. And then we can also define a second option which tries to lead, reach the state with minimum value. And another benefit of this is that actually here we don't just get reward when we reach the, the terminal state, right? We get, because of the, the, each state has a, has a proto value, this, this gives us an effect of reward shaping. Right, so, so the agent kind of gets some help in knowing which direction it should go to reach the, the determination state. Okay. And of course, all of this is so far is for the tabular setting as well, which doesn't scale that well. But you can use, instead of using the successor representation, you can use something called successor features, which essentially does the same thing, but in a given feature space. Okay, so then you can get something that scales better than having to uh, act on, the, on, uh, on a representation where you treat each state separately. Okay, so again, the, the, the main contribution is to simultaneously identify subtask structure, what should the termination state be, and what should the option reward function be. And the limitations are that, well, first of all, successor features are specific to a given policy. So if I improve my policy, and I want successor features for that policy, I have to compute the successor features again. <clears throat> and successor features are essentially as expensive to compute as a value function because you can, you can state the successor features, you can state a Bellman equation for these successor features. Right? So, so you have to do a lot of work to learn these, these successor features. Another limitation is that it ignores reward, right? It just, it just uh, uh, discovers the dynamics of the problem, but potentially where, where the, the, go, the state I'm interested in reaching might not correspond to the termination states of the options that I get when I, when I do this. Okay, and uh, a related idea is something called covering options, which is also based on the eigenvector, actually the smallest, uh, the eigenvector with smallest eigenvalue of the successor representation. And uh, these covering options actually only move from one single state to another single state. And intuitively, you can think of these options as trying to reduce the horizon, uh, the, the diameter of the problem as much as possible. Right? The diameter of a problem is what's the, what's the, what's the longest distance between two, between two pairs of states? I'd like to introduce some option that reduces the diameter of the problem, because the diameter also impacts how, how fast we can learn uh, a problem. So we try to introduce options that reduce the, the distance between states as much as possible. So, so they might look something like this. But the limitation here is that each covering option is only applicable in two states, right? Either I go one way or I go the other way, right? So, so they have very, very small initiation sets, right? So, um, okay, and, and finally, um, there is this uh, formalism called reward machines, which was proposed by um, Torre Carte et al. From, from Toronto, where the reward, so the idea is to describe the reward using a, a finite state automaton, right? So, uh, and where you define some set of high level events. So in this example, there's the agent is the triangle, and the agent can interact with these objects. Each of these objects here is considered a high-level event. And on the right is a reward machine that tells you what you have to do in order to get reward. So in this case, you have to 
the, you have to get, so this object is a sugar cane and the other one is a rabbit. So you have to take a sugar cane, bring it to the white table, get a rabbit, bring it to the white table, and then go to the black table. Not to, in, the idea is to, you need these resources to produce something. And you can get the sugar cane and the rabbit in either order. Right? You can either get the sugar cane first or the rabbit first. Okay? And several authors have shown that you can learn. So, so the relation to hierarchical reinforcement learning is that each of these edges, each of the edges of the reward machine can be thought of as a subtask, right? So getting the rabbit means I have to navigate to, till I trigger the, the rabbit event, which is when I step on it. Uh, so I, have, I, can, I can solve a problem. If I have a reward machine description of a problem, I can solve it using hierarchical reinforcement learning by, this, you know, by, by making these local policies that achieve these, these subtasks. And many authors have shown how to learn, automatically learn uh, reward machines from traces of high-level events. Right? So this is also a form of subtask discovery. You know, I interact with my environment. I see which event, which sequences of events trigger reward, and then I build this reward machine, and that provides a subtask structure for doing hierarchical reinforcement learning. Okay, so I'm uh, almost out of time, so I'll try to go quickly for the last part. Okay, so, so the last part, right, is about transfer learning, right? So the, the intuition is that because in hierarchical reinforcement learning we have a lot of subtasks, there are a lot of opportunities to transfer knowledge from, from one to the other. Uh, I would say the simplest form of transfer learning that people proposed already back in the 90s when, when people started applying hierarchical reinforcement learning is when I have, if I have two options that act on the same state space, so here are two options that act in this top left room in our example. One has to reach the right doorway and the other one has to reach the bottom doorway. And if I sample a transition using one of the options, then this, this transition could have been sampled also using the second option, so I can use it to update the, option, the policy of the second option as well. Okay, so this, this is called intra-option learning or intra-task learning. And, and this tends to speed up learning of the option policies, right? Because you reuse the experience uh, accumulated by one option to learn about another option policy. Uh, what people have studied more recently is something called goal-conditioned policies, where the idea is simply to encode the goal state, right? So I, I might have a set of states that are possible goals for the agent. With, or, or you can think of this in, in hierarchical reinforcement learning as possible termination states that I might want to go to. Uh, like in the case of the doorways, I might want to reach the right doorway or the bottom doorway. Then I can encode the goal as part of the state and try to learn a policy from state goal pairs to actions. What action should I take given my state is this and my goal is right now is this. Okay. Uh, if I'm in the tabular setting, this is really equivalent to learning separate policies because I have to learn a separate policy for each individual goal state. But uh, if I'm doing function approximation, I might be able to learn a goal condition policy more efficiently than having to learn a separate policy for each of these goals. Okay, so many, many authors have studied this in the context of hierarchical reinforcement learning. Right, and the limitation here is that it's, of course, it's harder to learn a policy that, that uh, can, can reach a number of goals because I make the problem harder. Uh, something that I think right, is, is a promising direction, at least, of hierarchical reinforcement learning is to try to make subtasks that only act on a subset of states. Right? We want sub, subtasks to be easier to solve. Right? So, one way to achieve such uh, options is to consider partitions of the state space. Right? So, so if we partition the state space, for example, according to the rooms in this example, then uh, each option only acts on a smaller part of the state space. And at the top level, under some conditions, the SMDB policy doesn't need to care about where in a room I am. Right? So I can abstract at the high level and say, the only states of the SMDP are going to be which, which room I'm in, okay? which, which, act, which option do I take in, in each room. Okay? 
So, so the, the benefit of this is that I achieve simplification both at the SMDP level and that at the option level. So I really made the, the, the problem easier. Okay, of course, and, and well, so this also means I would like some properties of the partition. I would like the partition to be more or less uh, the same size everywhere, etc. Because learning a partition is not particularly easy. Right. If, 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 so, so there have been some examples of, of researchers trying to learn partitions from, from experience. Uh, a related uh, idea, which I didn't put here, is to, again, to identify some landmark states. Okay, so, so I might put some landmarks in my environment, and I have options for reaching those landmarks. And each option is only applicable close to that landmark. I, I don't care about reaching the landmark from far away. So I have to kind of step through the landmarks to reach some far away point. So there are several works along that, along that line as well, which achieves a similar effect. Each option acts on a smaller part of the state space. Uh, another idea that uh, was proposed recently is to exploit something called compositionality. Or so, so if I have already a set of uh, reward functions, and I've learned policies for those reward functions, and I'm given a new reward function which can, exp can be expressed as a weighted sum of the existing reward functions, then I can exploit several of the ideas that I mentioned, so well, successor features and something called generalized policy evaluation to estimate a policy for the new reward function without learning. Okay? This is not going to be an exact or an optimal reward policy for this reward function, but it will be a good approximation. And, and people use the, the option keyboard is an application of this idea to hierarchical reinforcement learning. Okay, yes. For partial models, what do you mean by partial models? So uh, when you have to, um, uh, when you have models that predict um, features of states uh, conditioned on uh, some uh, features of the state. Okay, well, so, so this can be used in the settings I've described here. Probably it could also be combined with features okay. in, in that way, but... Uh, um, okay, so reward machines, you can also do transfer, only to put this again, because if, if you have two, if I have um, two transitions in the reward machine that requires me to go get the rabbit, of course I can reuse the policy from one to, to the other. So I can do transfer learning in reward machines as well. Uh, something that you can also exploit if, right, if there are some partitions of my state space that are exactly the same dynamics, like, uh, like the three middle rooms, the, the, the column of the three middle rooms have exactly the same dynamics. So if I learn a policy for reaching the right door, I can reuse that in the other rooms as well. Uh, Okay, well, so, in, uh, so of course, in this example, having exactly the same size of the rooms is a bit uh, unrealistic. But when you're using factor representations, you can automatically get these equivalent classes if you have this conditional independence. Okay, so that, this is a more uh, realistic scenario in which you can exploit such, such equivalents. Okay, I'm going to go quickly because I'm out of time. Okay, so, so just the last thing, I just want to mention one, one work that I've been doing with a PhD student, which is similar idea to the options keyboard, for, but for a particular class of MDPs called linearly solvable MDPs, in which the Bellman optimality equation is linear. And because the Bellman optimality equation is linear, I can apply a form of compositionality in which I have, if I have a set of boundary states, and I learn policies for reaching each of these boundary states, and I, I now give you another task which with, with arbitrary reward on the, on, the, on the boundary states, then I can achieve an optimal policy for this new problem without learning. Okay, so for LMDPs, because of the linear Bellman equation, this is, op this is optimal. And we've exploited this to... Uh, recently to, uh, to obtain uh, a formalism of hierarchical reinforcement learning, where, so, so in, this, in this example we have four rooms again, 
And on the right is an equivalent subtask, which is, well, it's equivalent of all of the rooms. So we define these five subtasks for, for exiting the room in each direction and for reaching a given goal location. If we solve this, then on the bottom level, we solve these five subtasks. Then on the top level, we only have to learn a value function on the green states. Okay. And the, the optimal value of all other states will be determined by these subtasks. Okay. And uh, I'm really out of time, but, but an interesting feature of this, I think, is that unlike all other forms of hierarchical reinforcement learning, in our work, the high-level policy never actually selects an individual subtask to apply. Instead, the value functions are composed by the value functions of the subtasks. And then the policy acts according to this value function. Okay, so I, don't, I think this is an interesting direction to explore. Okay, well, so just to summarize, I mean, there are some, some limitations of hierarchical reinforcement learning. There's, there hasn't been a lot of unified terminology, common benchmarks. It's a big problem, I think, when people write papers. They all work on different problems. It's hard to compare to previous work. There are no killer applications. The only application I've seen is, is StarCraft, and there are few theoretical guarantees. But on the other hand, there are many open research questions. I think there's a lot of uh, opportunity for research uh, in this field. Okay, I will stop there. Thank you, Anders.